we could move on to some questions that we might have, though. We could, if I didn't have to go pee. This podcast is now available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and more. Please leave a written review on whatever app you get this podcast from. Spoiler alert! When this podcast talks about the television series Game of Thrones, it talks in the context of the most recently aired episode. And when it talks about George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series, it talks in the context of the most recently released book. You've been warned. Dedicated to HBO's Game of Thrones and George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire series, you're listening to Game of Thrones, Matt's audio blog. And now, here's your host, Matt Murdock. And welcome back to Game of Thrones, Matt's audio blog, another Thursday cast, another one with our good friend Kelly, who's joining us to look at Season 5, Episode 4, Sons of the Harpy, written by Dave Hill and directed by Mark Mylod. And I'm happy to have you along, Kelly. How are you doing today? Oh, so good. I know we get to do all of these podcasts together, definitely right in a row, definitely not split up and done out of order at all. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because, you know, as I recall, you were on the third episode as well and the second episode. <laughs> it seems like you've been here just like three nights in a row. I know. Everyone must be sick of me by now, <laughs> especially oh. Matt. <laughs> no, nobody could ever be sick of the siren of a song of ice and fire from the West. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's Not right. to be associated with the Wicked Witch of the West. That's a totally different thing. Oh. All of the sirens of a song of ice and fire <laughs> are good sirens. We just went to the same sorority. It's not no relation directly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Folks, if you want to contact the podcast, feel free to do so. You can send emails to Matt's Audio Blog, M A T T S Audio Blog, at gmail.com, or you can tweet to Matt's G O T Blog on the Twitter, M A T T S G O T Blog on the Twitter, or you can go to Matt's Audio Blog.com, that's M A T T S Audio Blog.com, to find all of the back episodes, to find uh, podcast app links. If you could leave me a written review, that'd be very helpful. Because when we're covering season eight, it'd be nice to have more than, you know, five or six subscribers. Now, actually, we have a lot more than that. I'm just kidding. But uh, what does help me stay more noticeable in the search engines is when people leave written reviews. So if you're taking the time to do so, I really appreciate that. Also, be sure to take the time to look into the show notes. Look over any of the musicians' names that are supplying music for these podcasts. Um, that's just personally important to me as a musician because I'm not asking you to buy any of their stuff or anything like that. I'm just asking that you acknowledge who the person is that you're hearing underneath the three-word segment or underneath the brothel mate segment or underneath Bubba announcing my name or introducing a segment or what have you. Um, it's important to me to promote my fellow musicians just in that way, just that you go, oh, that person did that music. That's all I ask of you. And with that, why don't we go ahead and get into, speaking of music, the musical analysis for this particular episode. We're going to look at two themes that have similarities to them. They're not exactly the same by any stretch of the imagination, but they have a peculiarity about each of them uh, that is the same, and they create the same effect, but they do so in different ways. The music on Game of Thrones. What would you say if I told you of a great sinner in our very midst, shielded by gold and privilege? May the Father judge him justly.
And that clip from when we first see what is now the empowered group of sparrows making sure that their sinners pay for the sins against the seven. And of course, that means that we now have a new theme to talk about. In fact, in this episode, we have two themes to talk about. This one for the sparrows and also one for the sons of the harpy. And oddly enough, both are for fanatical groups and oddly enough, both are quite untraditional in the way that harmony is used to create the emotion of fear or dread. But before we compare the two themes, first, let's break down this theme for the sparrows. And the first thing that you may have noticed about this theme is the running bass line throughout, because it does kind of have a familiar sound to it. I'm talking about this part. What does that remind you of? Well, for someone my age, it reminds me a little bit of the theme for Jaws by John Williams. And let's face it, that's a pretty scary movie, Jaws is. So it does have that going for it to somewhat psychologically or subliminally suggest fear to us. Also, the notes are moving pretty fast. So actually what happens in your mind, it creates a very uncomfortable sound. And even though it's not performed that way, your mind is sometimes hearing this. But perhaps the most interesting thing about this theme is that it uses major harmony. The melody starts out like this. And then the second phrase goes like this. So what happens there is the melody by itself implies a major harmony instead of a what we normally associate with a, a scary thing would be a minor harmony right but you get this sound and now you're saying of course but matt ever since the very first episode you've told us that major harmony makes us feel happy or at peace and yes that's right on its own it does ah there's a key phrase there on its own but don't forget that we do also have this other dissonance ringing around our head at the same time that we're hearing that melody. And when you combine that major harmony with that dissonance, well, here's what you get. That's not exactly happy sounding, right? And that's how Ramin kind of gets away with using major harmony and still making you feel disturbed, at least in this case. Also, there is a matter of timbre as well, the sounds that we hear. And we hear a low male voice choir that's singing along. And you might say, but Matt, didn't you outline to us how Ramin uses voices for Essos mostly? Yes, I did. And I can tell you that Ramin still hasn't broken that rule. The sparrows are part of the religion of the seven, right? Well, the religion of the seven finds its roots in the Andals. Remember how the kings are always saying, are being pronounced as the kings of the Andals and the first men? Well, the Andals were a group of people who came over and warred with the first men over, guess what? Religion. And since the Andals have the religion of the seven, and the religion of the seven is still Essos in origin, Ramin's still okay to use voices here. So he hasn't broken the rule. But in actuality, I think that the truth about these vocals is that the theme itself reminded me much more of a type of Gregorian chant, say like from the old Catholic church sacraments and that. And if you recall, Gregorian chant, if you've studied music history at all, was used during the church mostly at a time when there was a whole lot of holy crusades going on, even inquisitions going on. So that adds an extra layer of depth to the ferocity of this group's fanatical ideas, right? And speaking of an extra layer of depth, here's something to think about regarding this theme. When we think of fanatics or zealots, we tend to think of them as being absolutists. Like take Melisandre, for example. 
When she told Davos in season two that an onion is either rotten or not, there's kind of no in-between for her, even though Davos said he had parts good and parts bad. Yet, for the most part, we see Melisandre in this kind of state of bliss most of the time because she's serving her Lord of Light. And in that way, a major melody actually really works for the Sparrows. The melody is how they are seeing what they're doing. It's perfectly a happy place. We need to be helping these sinners get over their sins. But the dissonance that Ramin places with it, and that's what makes us uncomfortable, is the view that Ramin is giving to us as viewers from the outside. And actually, with that thought in mind, let's take a listen to the theme a little more as it ramps up even more before the theme ends uh, as they approach Loris. that it's time to talk about the other theme in the episode for a group of different kinds of fanatics the sons of the harpy we get a very pronounced theme with heavy percussion by the way heavy percussion is also similar to the sparrow theme and in this particular theme we'll also get some major harmony let's listen <laughs> Now, the main melody, again, has a major element to it, at least at first, but it does end on a dissonant note. But here's the melody. So yeah, that last note kind of sticks out, and it creates the dissonance that, in a way, kind of cancels the major out, this note right here. And on top of that, when the piece ramps up, we kind of lose the major sound altogether, at certain points and we get little motives like this. So what exactly is happening here? Well, again, Ramin is using some form of dissonance to distract you from the major sound. Um, this last note that I just played for you is actually what sticks in your head the most because it's what you last heard and he always seems to have a little bit of space in there after you hear that note. So you forget about the major sound because the last note in your ears told you it should have actually been part of a minor sound. That note would have fit with the bass line in a minor chord as opposed to a major chord. And it's very effective. And again, Ramin conveys 
to us that this group seems perfectly happy to kill Unsullied, but by adding that dissonant note, that's what gives us the outside picture that we have and makes us feel uncomfortable. And in the last clip that I have for you today, you're going to hear more of that as those intervals ramp up. Just like the Sparrow theme ramped up, you're going to hear when the Sons of the Harpy theme ramps up, you're going to hear things like this. But let me demonstrate to you the difference between an implied dissonance and what would have been totally major. If we'd have played the thing totally based on the major scale, you would have heard it like this. And that seems a lot happier, right? So the rules still apply. It's just that Ramin decided to do that dissonant note uh, to make us feel uncomfortable. Again, the theme note that you'll hear is like this. Also, this clip includes Barristan's final battle, really, as he fights and he represents Daenerys in the grandest of ways. Uh, the love in the eyes theme that is hers is played with these big horn sounds. Um, I'm talking about this theme. And the particular version of this is really dramatic. It's got little elements from the Sons of the Harpy theme playing against it. It's got movement in the strings. It's got big horns. It's got changes in chords with this rising thing. But I've already talked about all of that way back in Podcast Winterfell many, many years ago uh, when I was covering this episode the first time around. So go to podcastwinterfell.com, find the episode where I was covering this particular episode of Game of Thrones, and you'll find my analysis of that. In the meantime, enjoy this final clip. We'll all pour one out for Barristan Selmy as we go, and I'll be back with Kelly in just a moment to discuss the story of this episode. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed the musical analysis section of the podcast. And we're going to get into talking about the story with Kelly here. It's season five, episode four, Sons of the Harpy, written by Dave Hill, directed by Mark Mylod. And Kelly, I typically like to start with things that are just kind of on the surface, stuff that may not be as important to the overall series as uh, some other things. Most of the time for me, that means more of the emotional stuff. On the surface. But uh, I see you have a much larger list than I do as I look at our notes here. So why don't <laughs> we start with something from you? Yeah. So like, for me, it just doesn't like fit necessarily into the big plot lines. It's more like the it might be the gentler wave that pushes the message in a bottle to the shore on a far shore. <laughs> it's kind of what on the surface looks to me. It's like that, the long game stuff that maybe isn't necessarily going to be directly pertinent very soon, but I, I can kind of, I, I can see what you mean by it. it's not as that could be like a big thing or something later. But for me, that's kind of hang on to this thought. It's kind of more of my thought on these things. <laughs> okay. So for like, just watching Cersei at work and then seeing um, Marjorie at work, it, there's a big contrast into how these play out. And you can kind of see like Cersei's manipulation tactics always have this like 
menace and this precariousness to them that always make her seem much more of an, a villain. And Marjorie's tactics seem on the surface to be much more benign. That gets her what she wants, but they're both equally manipulative. It's just that, I don't know, I just find Cersei's way that she caters to people's like lesser traits, the way she kind of like intrigues the 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 high sparrow to this list position of power as you know he wants power people want power so he, she caters to that whereas marjorie's kind of well tommen likes love and she'll just cater to that and at the end of the day that leaves cersei really vulnerable whereas marjorie is still loved so i was kind of like watching that unfold <laughs> yeah totally understood you got a couple of instances uh, that i think relate very well to that but the truth of the matter is for me, and the way I'll fold into your subject here is to say that for me, it was kind of more of an emotional thing because I'm sitting here looking at Tommen as Marjorie is manipulating him saying, you know, I need to be with my family and, and all of this stuff uh, in order to get him to act um, or to punish him for not being able to follow through with acting. Um Tommen is b literally the, the rope in this tug of war, and, and he's the one who's going to, to suffer um, in, the, in the most horrible of ways. Um, and it just seems sad to me that the, probably the most innocent of the Lannisters, I don't think Marcella was uninnocent or anything like that, but I, it, it just seems like Tommen was always just the purest kind of kid, right, and always had the best intentions, and I guess the truth, the truth is, is that sometimes you do end up in your own personal hell as a result of your good intentions, because this poor kid, you know, being the most innocent of all these kids is basically just fodder for Marjorie and Cersei to pull at each other with, you know, he's just the rope. Absolutely. And, he's a, he's the tool that both of them want to use for their own project. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and especially it's just seems really sad when you consider that at the end, you know, the death of his wife ends up leading to his own suicide. So he gets hurt by the fact that his wife is dead and he can't be around anymore. And then even after death, it doesn't seem like his mother can properly grieve him because she's already accepted that the prophecy will come true and that doesn't even make her i don't know it just makes her cold to to tommen's death and worse uh it makes her seize an opportunity to grab power for herself oh yeah after tommen dies she's just totally uh hopeless for like positivity in her life so it's just let me just get as much neutral power that I can get. And by neutral, I mean like it doesn't bring her happiness. It just gives her some sort of fulfillment. And and that's where she can at least feel, fill that part of her life as opposed to any amount of maternal happiness or anything joyful for sure. And yeah, like Tommen's just this little like, he's people pleaser from the beginning, like just tortured by by his brother, you know, and just wanting, to, you know, Joffrey is just this monster to him. And he just wants to be, he really is the antithesis of Joffrey, you know, especially in this episode, you see him like on the steps of the sept where isn't that somewhere near at least where Joffrey killed uh, Ned. And you just see like even the idea of like fighting for what he as a king is demanding on the steps is like abhorrent to him. And he turns around and leaves Whereas, like, you put Joffrey in that situation, it's a complete, like, 180 in how that is handled. So this kid who's just this complete innocent trying to please everybody, and then you've got these two powerful women on either side of him, and they want power. He has it by happenstance, and they are just using their specific methods to get out of him what they can. Exactly. Exactly. It's very sad to me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and it's tragic once we know how this all plays out. Yeah, because nobody ends up happy. <laughs> exactly. Everybody loses, basically. The interesting thing here is that by the time that Tommen does die, uh, Cersei has given up on any hope of saving her children, right? So, or any of her children, I guess. And you could, you could, you look yeah, but you could kind of like wonder how long ago she did have that, like, hope lost where she she you know obviously she's struggling with it with like you know making jamie this like target of her anger about all of it but 
you know, you didn't protect him. How good did that do you and all that? But, right. you know, she she plays at it. But if you yeah. look back at it, like how long ago did she start this like uh, nihilism to her fate that all of her children will die and she'll be left with only herself? Well, I, I was going to say that it actually doesn't feel to me like in season five that point has been turned yet. I don't think it's until Jamie returns with Marcella's body where mm. you see her openly admit for the first time that, you know, about the prophecy to Jamie. And he says, oh, that's just bugger. Um, and I, I feel like that that's the point where she starts to believe. And, and, and therefore, Tom, and, you know, she just has given up that she's going to lose Tom and at some point. Yeah, they show us the, the the flashback at the beginning of the season, though. So I wonder if we're supposed to start start reading into her actions a little bit more with that context in mind, and going back to seeing like maybe seeing it as how tightly she holds on to Joffrey and Tom and like and Marcella even like how how fearful she is of not letting them be their own person and constantly manipulating them in that time frame, looking at it through that lens, perhaps. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> what else have you got for this particular episode on the surface? Yeah. So the the couple of examples that you mentioned that I had were, where you see how Cersei uh, just is completely manipulating um, Papa Tyrell, just you know, just stroking his ego <laughs> mm-hmm. to get him out of town. Now that leaves her open to fill, fulfill the rest of her plans, which are just like it is just like chess. She's just it's you can't admire it but you can like (laughs) i don't know respect it at least maybe (laughs) she does handle this like handling her her business in king's landing uh after time when and after jamie's gone like by upholding her i don't know her lannister name and and at least this way a little bit it's kind of cool and you know you don't have to admire cersei to admire that she's getting what she wants i guess (laughs) yeah well and you mentioned jamie and i i on a rewatch this time around, I've kind of put this whole Marcella mission that she laid at Jamie's feet um, to be part of the same kind of manipulation because she knows she can't get away with hurting Marjorie probably while Jamie is around. Right. Yeah. If even just to like tangentially protect Tom and yeah, Mm -hmm. he wouldn't let her do anything to Marjorie. Right. Yeah. I see that. And your other point? Oh, was yeah, then how just down the line plot wise, this getting Tyrell out of town plays out and it also puts uh one of the you know, the the King's guard at his side, which again just stroking his ego, thinking he's that important and but in her plot, it's really putting a assassin in line to take care of the Tyrell family as she's about to unleash this plot against them. And it's just, Mm -hmm. she's keeping herself in check, in check, in check, you know? Yeah, that's a good catch. I wouldn't (laughs) have uh, put that together, even on a rewatch, but that's definitely correct, as I can see it now. As you usually are, Kelly, as you usually are. Usually, not always, man, not always. (laughs) We have our Drogon moments. But other than that, I think you're usually pretty correct. Uh, anything else on the surface? Just a couple really like light ones that come into play later that might play into some of our other thoughts later is just that um, dialogue moments that I think are are key and I pay more attention to now, especially in this season now that we're like definitely in uh, show territory and out of book territory. You can kind of tell that they're they're laying it on thick, <laughs> mm. and so there's lots of like not so subtle. <laughs> Um, yeah. implications that on a on a rewatch it just is glaring but on this point it's like Slee's kind of mentions in passing a couple of things that um, have rebukes by two different characters so she kind of sets up that you know uh, that John he's just a a, a whelp of a, a tavern prostitute and, and Ned Stark and you know Stannis has a remark that lays some doubt onto that idea and then she also sets up this idea of like, oh, Shireen, she's useless. I've never given you anything good. And then Melisandre says, well, actually. Right. <laughs> so it's just kind of this, this kind of maybe finding a use for the character Solis the writers are doing, whereas normally it just kind of seems like she's in the background being antagonizing or just hurtful to characters that we care about. But 
I kind of liked that she was a more of a setup character for these plot points to kind of get a little bit of a reveal early on. Nice. Anything else? I just laughed at when Mel says to John that the dead don't need lover, it was only the living. Just someone telling John about being dead <laughs> and how you don't need that. You're alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On a rewatch, it just has a little bit more of a meaning to it. So that's, I think that's good for, for on the surface and just little laughy moments, little this could mean something moments. Well, let's move on to our three big things then. Mm. Three, three big things. And uh, I'm going to save the, my first one there and to tie in after you give your uh, second one there. But what is your first big <laughs> thing? Yeah, this this episode kind of had big plot points moving, but of course it's like turning a ship. They're really slow, but we'll see like the the consequence of them in a much greater effect by the end of the season. But now we have the Faith the Militant. And up till now we were always like, "Oh, the Faith's the High Sparrow. He's so good. Look at him. Oh. <laughs> He's not even wearing shoes. He makes Cersei like come out of like down to this like dirty alley to talk to him and he like she didn't even recognize him like the show just sets him up to be this truly benevolent character but like as soon as he gets like two scenes along with Cersei <laughs> he is like flipped he is now like sending his hordes out he's just getting like his deed done as quickly as possible which is just the most brutal way possible it it just shows how quickly like power can turn a character or a person from their ideals and their high ground into like their like their lesser traits in order to achieve what they believe to be their higher goals and it's just oh, it was just it was uh, it was it was sad because there are so many real world parallels to it that it was just like no this good character <laughs> <laughs> Even he, well, I, even him, Matt, even him. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the whole idea of the faith militant, um, it, the thing that always struck me was, okay, well, it, it was brought up at some point. I think it was in this episode. It's like, well, the faith militant was disbanded, right? It hadn't been for around for a couple hundred years. Right. Yeah. And it's like, hmm, there must be a reason for that. Mm. And <laughs> now we see the reason for that more or less. Um, religious fanaticism, um, in any shape or form is not necessarily a, a good thing. Yeah. I mean, you could have looked at it as religious suppression or some sort of discrimination against religion. Like you could have had like a, you know, a very naive, innocent opinion as to why the faith militant had been disbanded. But yes, obviously very swiftly we see why it, you know, the, the, um, shoeless soup serving uh high sparrow while dangerous to cersei was like actually a good thing and of course as soon as she feeds into his you know tiny little human side his like negative human trait of like a desire for power and it, because with power he could change things the way he wanted and of course all of these good attributes but then <laughs> It immediately turns to this wickedness that is totally up Cersei's alley and plays right into how she probably foresaw that playing out. True, true. And and the funny thing is, is that even when later on, when this whole kind of thing turns on her, he still feels like he's in the right doing all of this stuff. The person in power always does, right? Like they yeah. they believe that the the ends justify their means, and that's totally Cersei's attitude all along and it, at some point you stop caring about the means and you just want to get to your ends but even like i think that would have been a little too much of a 180 for this character for them to go like from shoeless to and soup serving to you know imprisoning and sending out guard or sending out like armed men against these people he was probably just serving you know like some of these people working at the brothels were probably some of the people that he was serving soup to or their families and just the way that it it, it turned into this like witch hunt either yeah. way you know the, the them is always scary and always once you have power to overtake the them you know it always turns into 
how many people look like them or how many people do I perceive as them? And when I didn't have power, I would have taken the time to understand or to dialogue. But now that I have power, I can just do what I want. Anything else on that particular subject? Yeah, well, just the, the comparison between this this like instant uprising of violence in King's Landing to this at the end of the episode, you get the like magnitude increase in violence and horror in um, <laughs> oh, in poor what, where is Danny <laughs> in Essos? <laughs> yeah, yeah, in Marine, there's just now suddenly you know like they were just doing this these one-off killings and now suddenly it's like a massacre they've now organized somehow and they've gotten empowered somehow and now it's just this dual horror but you know you've got one queen who's like you know feeding into it cersei and you've got this other queen who's you know fighting against it and trying to find a solution and is the target of it it's just kind of a cool contrast at this point in the in the show between these two characters yeah yeah, and that brings me actually to one of my big things, and that is the death of Barristan Selmy. Um, of course, yes. <laughs> yeah, he he is the the one advisor who has always counseled mercy, more or less, to Daenerys. Um, and even his little story about Rhaegar uh, in this particular episode tells a story of mercy in a way about how he would give the money to the next troubadour over or to uh to someone poor or maybe even just to allow barristan <laughs> to have a good time <laughs> you know um so all of that uh really hit me as uh you know just this one last thing of mercy uh and i know that that plays into something else that we'll talk about uh in this particular section as well but i i just wanted to point out that you know at this point and and we'll see the result of it in the very next episode is um, danny doesn't have anybody like that to hold her back at that point Mm -hmm. uh, except for herself and so she's going to uh, make a very rash decision uh, and then be kind of pulled back in by misande in the next episode but this this is uh this event of, of the death of Selmy is what triggers something to, that, to me, is just as bad as the crucifixion of the of the masters. Mm-hmm. No, and you were saying the contrast between like every all of Barristan's counsel and everything she got from everyone else, and you even had in that story he was contrasting between what Viserys had told her about Rhaegar. That you know, didn't Rhaegar tell you that he sang? And she was like, he, she told me that he, or he told me that he killed, you know, that he was very good at killing. And and I was like, no, you know, this, this other side of him. And that's what Barristan wanted to tell her about, as opposed to these right. these other stories. Yeah, that that contrast even came in there. And then yeah, <laughs> that 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 voice of of reason. You know, maybe that's age. Maybe that's experience talking. Maybe that's you know his him just him his own unique take on the world that you know even brought him to her but yeah like she definitely loses a a voice and I'm really glad at least we got to to hear some of these stories and I'm hoping you know in my head canon you know he's told her dozens more of these stories about Rhaegar and of Westeros and of you know her father and all of these these wisdoms that we've gotten on screen I kind of hope that he's threaded himself into her character you know by yeah. now well, we could hope yeah because he was he was just this this you know in a world of people who made dumb decisions if they were good even though they were good or you know were bad and somehow got to the this point like little finger you know you've got you've got characters like barris and Salome that at least made it to this point in the show and you know had held on to their integrity and their you know goodness and you still liked them. Oh, dang. Sad. <laughs> yeah, it was inevitable that he was going to have to die when you put it like that. I know, I know. As I was saying it, I was like, oh, well, how did he make it that long? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but we got it. We did get it. <laughs> we did get it. What else have you got? Oh, uh, yeah. As as you hinted at, we had uh, my big point that I, I slightly mentioned earlier. It was just how many of these 
just R plus L equals J stories that we got that just hit you over the head with it at this point in the show. And I, I appreciated it. I thought, you know, let's have it just spelled out. This is a show. Let's get to it. Show me, tell me, do whatever you got to do. Get the story to me. <laughs> hmm. And we sure did from, you know, Stannis's comment earlier, then little finger just flat out monologuing about the tourney of Heron Hall and questioning what Sansa knew about the situation. And then, yeah, to Barristan's reminiscing about Rhaegar's, you know, goodness and his singing and, and, how just the contrast between these people that we that we thought we knew their backstories of right. <laughs> yeah very good and and i will throw on top of that uh melisandre's sudden interest in getting it on with Jon snow because <laughs> uh i basically my big thing was john has king's blood and uh, like you said there were a lot of hints to kind of disqualify rhaegar as this as this kidnapper and then you have uh, this whole thing with Melisandre just being ready to to show Jon Snow what life is all about, even though he knows nothing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I guess that, that whole line about cast shadows was, was what really hit me this time around. But I think it hit me the first time around, too, because I was one of the book readers who obviously already had an idea about the R plus L equals J. But I got really tired of up to this point hearing podcasters who were TV only saying that they thought they knew that Jon Snow was, was something, you know, else or whatever. Cause to me, the show had never really hinted about anything like that in a way that you could put it together unless you already knew what it was trying to be put together. Um, so I just, I, anytime somebody, said something about R plus L equals J or alluded to it. Um, that was a TV only person. Um, my mind maybe pre prejudicially, uh, went to the fact that, Oh, you, you've, you've been on, you've been on the <laughs> Song of Ice and Fire forums that, you know, um, after this episode though, if somebody said, Oh, you know what? After that episode, I think, I think I'm coming up with this idea. I would have been totally on board with them saying as much, you know? Yeah. Well, oh, for sure. It, it has been, I don't know. This was two, two or three years ago. The show up to this point has been, geez, seven years ago. Like if people at any time between there had this suspicion, I mean, sincerely, if they did, like then I say they were ahead of their time because I think this show and shows since this have kind of taken on the, giving show watchers a, a little bit of a, you know, giving their TV show audience some credit and giving them a little bit more nuance and giving them some intrigue that plays out later that you can look back on and see it was woven in early on. But like, that was not a thing. Like, that, that was a fairly new concept to, to do. And I just, that's why I wasn't surprised when like little fingers monologue and, and all of these kind of overt, you know, references that they're putting it in the show now, because up till now it was all like book material. And now it's kind of like, all right, we got to get this out and we got to make this clear because we've only got a you know, couple seasons left and we want to yeah. make flush this out by then. And yeah, no, I, and I, I totally think that that was a good point of turn right here in this, in this episode. And that line directly at John for sure made it seem like, because up until now, like maybe people only thought that like the idea of uh, Ned, being John's dad, you know, well, maybe that's not entirely true. Or maybe the idea that like Rhaegar raped Lyanna, well, maybe that's not entirely true. Like you've got these doubts, but like tying it all together into what the consequence going forward would be. And that being John and John being this, you know, King's blood container <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like that's the consequence and that's the important part. And uh, I think that tied it together and that tied it together maybe the most clearly to date in this episode for sure. And yeah, Melisandre, of course they did it with like nudity on screen. So it would like <laughs> distract. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. It's the, it's the old sleight of hand. You know? it's like, Look over here. By the way, Jon Snow. So is, to speak, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> Melisandre was eyeing Jon's sleight of hand. <laughs> yeah. Well, Melisandre was 
John's hand was sliding. We have to say that for sure. I, I loved it. She was just like, I'm just showing you what we're fighting for, which is life. And suddenly you're fondling me. Did you notice? Like, you're just her face. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but of course she knew what she was doing she's the best she's amazing <laughs> right on. she knows what she's doing and the, the showrunners knew what they were doing too just to make you forget about the king's blood <laughs> for just a second and every um, out, everyone admit we all were distracted that was lovely <laughs> i can't i can't don't argue um, you can't criticize you know. a, a, a any woman's presence you know so there we go. Uh, anyway. <laughs> no, but that's a good point. That is a good point. This is kind of the most overt right to John's face. And that might even be important, too. The fact that this is Melisandre's first, like anybody's first, like indication to John's face that he is important. Right. Yeah. Right. What else do you got? Give me another one. Uh, well, I will go to the introduction of the Sand Snakes. That's my mm -hmm. last one. And the introduction of the Sand Snakes, while I know, I it, you know, I was a book reader too, and um, the arc of the Sand Snakes was not quite what I had hoped, but I do feel like they, they play an important part, parts that we haven't seen happen in the books yet. Um, it, there was an attack on Marcella, um, but as far as we know in the books, Marcella is still very much alive. And uh, so that makes these very important, not just because of where they go in power or what they do to Doran or, or anything like that. It's more about the way they affect Cersei in the long run, to me, at the beginning of season six. Oh, yeah. And giving Cersei like female opposition, I think, is really a, kind of a cool change of pace. Like, um, obviously, she's got like female opposition in the way of like... Subtrifuge. Lady Elena and, yeah, and Marjorie. But that's always yeah. like pleasantries and courtesies and whatnot. But now you've actually got these women who probably play into the side of Cersei that she would want to tap into and, and play out if she weren't such a highborn King's Landing princess mm. type, you know? Mm -hmm. So I like the contrast of these the way that this female group is playing towards, you know, the different like the the courtly female group <laughs> of like political, you know, uh, opposition, which is a totally overt version versus this subterfuge version. And like you get the whole spectrum and Sa and Cersei is just facing it all. And it, it, they're just a cool counterpart to a different side of her that I like that we get to see. And no, and, and you're right. Like we, we don't know how these characters play out in the books and right. it doesn't play out great in the show, but here, I, I didn't mind it in this episode. No, in this particular episode, there was still a lot of hope to have for him, uh, at least as far as the potential for the storyline. Because all, all we do really is just get kind of an introduction to him and, and, and in a ferocious way as well, you know, with that captain and, and everything. So it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to see how all of that finally played out, even to the point where, um, it, it almost just seems fitting that Cersei's revenge on Alaria is what it is once they finally get them in King's Landing. That's true, especially with this scene of Nymeria. Is it Nymeria that comes at her? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's her actual, in the show, her her daughter. The, yeah, just the way that she is just immediately at her side and, and the way she embraces her. Yeah, the way that they end as far as we've seen them yeah it's just it is kind of horrible to re-see this at this moment now oh they've such, got such big plans and such like positive like energy about themselves and what they're capable of <laughs> right well and, and you know it's another thing where i feel like that book readers um felt the sting doubly because we were like as soon as these characters were coming on screen we were poking at our our, our tv only friends you know poking them in the ribs saying oh these chicks are <laughs> badass just wait you know they're, they're just know. they're so amazing <laughs> you're gonna love these characters and then you know they, they didn't 
Dave and Dan just had too much for George. You know, he can spread a single set of characters out <laughs> over two books as he did. You know. Oh yeah. Dave and Dan do not have that kind of luxury naturally. Yeah, uh, and the Sand so- Snakes were always tempered through the eyes of Ariane. We saw them through their eyes as opposed to like as our focal point. You know, and that's a whole different way to experience them. I think so. Having that, um, that that <laughs> we got to, we kind of viewed them like third or fourth person. From the books, mm-hmm. whereas in the show we're like second slash third, you know, pursing them. Right. It's just a little too close that they never really got as fleshed out, maybe in the book, as they could be filled in in a show that way. <laughs> right. Well, and and the the biggest thing going against this whole set of characters in the television show was the fact that Pedro Pascal had done Oberyn Martell so brilliantly, mm. in my opinion. You know, that there was no way that the writers could write or that the actors could bring. And this is nothing on the actresses themselves. I think they're all fantastic actresses. Uh, but I, I, it's just the, the, the chances of them equaling that, let alone surpassing that the way at least the Sand Snakes in the books do for me. Um, to me, the Sand Snakes in the books... Um, go, they kind of one up over it. it. It's the, my favorite thing about Feast for Crows. <laughs> yeah. To be perfectly honest. They kind of um, like make him seem foolish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and so, um, there was no way that the show was going to be able to do that the way that they had built up Oberyn Martell just so brilliantly and casted him perfectly. And Pedro had given, you know, probably the performance of his lifetime. Oh, and the timing uh, where you have Oberyn just coming into King's Landing with his exotic, you know, entourage. And they're all just this breath of fresh air. Just even the context where we got him was just uh-huh. couldn't couldn't be, you know, compared to with, with where we got, you know, these characters in their homeland and you get their you know, everyone around them and they don't have the support and you got, you know, you totally introduce them in contrast with this very reasonable Doran. And it's like, well, <laughs> and they're in exact opposition to like our supposed hero, Jamie and Braun. Like it just, they didn't have a lot of factors going for them. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. How about you? What else you got? Oh, I had, I did have the, the Sons of the Harpy kill Barris and my only caveat, uh, like not caveat, my addition to that was that they've also killed a ton of Unsullied and this just mm. sparks this whole new phase of Danny's ruling in, in Marine that I think, you know, alters a lot of things going forward. Um, but, uh, besides that, I did have uh, that Jorah is taking Tyrion to Marine and just in the same episode, we find out that Jorah is taking Tyrion to Marine. Where we just found out that Danny lost one of her advisors, um, one like her only tie to Westeros, and now she's about to get these two, and they're sure you know she doesn't want one of them, and she doesn't know about the other one, but <laughs> we know that they are this wealth of information for her, and there's hope where there's loss in this moment. I don't. Well, I hope that, uh, you know, folks, you have watched the whole series so that we can spoil <laughs> anything about the Sand Snakes with you. And read the books, um, I guess. And, uh, and, well, we didn't really say what happens in the books okay, per se okay. so much. <laughs> uh, we said what hasn't happened in the books so much. Okay. But everybody knows that the oh, television show is ahead of the books now. So that's not uh, that much of a betrayal, I hope. Uh, we can move on to some questions that we might have, though. Questions. questions. So, Kelly, you have some questions, right? So many questions. Specifically in this episode, though. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go with the the first one that I kind of might have an answer to, but I want to get your take on. So, in the crypt, um, Littlefinger monologues about his plans to Sansa. And we kind of know how they play out. And we kind of always credit Littlefinger with knowing what's going on and having like plans on plans on plans. So, like, how much of this plan that he lays out for her and knowing now how poorly, like, any of that actually comes to fruition, like, how much of that do you think he actually believed? That he believed about the tournament? Oh, I'm sorry. His, when he's talking about how leaving her in, in at Winterfell, he's got to go to King's Landing, lest Cersei gets suspicious, and how 
Stannis is going to have to oh, okay. come. And if Stannis takes out the Boltons, then he'll Stannis will install Sansa, and like these, all of these plans that he kind of lays out. Right. Um, I think that Littlefinger is probably just doing what he always does, actually, and that's just postulating possibilities so that he can be able to react to anything that's going to happen. Because we see in a later episode when he's talking to Cersei, he basically says, let the Boltons and whatever uh, and and uh, Stannis fight it out for themselves. I'll come in with the Knights of the Vale and clean up whatever's left. You just have to install me as the Warden of the North, right? So he's yeah. he's just... He's thinking of all the possibilities just so that he can know how best to react to them because that's what he does best, right? Yeah. He throws he throws a stone in the in the lake and uh, sees which ripples are biggest and uh, learns how to uh, you know either use those ripples to move his boat along or <laughs> or to uh, or to you know avoid them to steer away from them. Yeah, but since he threw the rock, he saw him coming, so he's prepared, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And now that you mentioned that part, that makes me feel much more like he's totally just telling Sansa the parts of his plan that could happen because he totally thrives on chaos. And hey, maybe that will happen. I just I wondered, like, if he really did care for Sansa, like if any, you know, if we could really like pin down any true character motivations, like can we even pin his motivation on his, you know, <sighs> I don't want to call it love, but like his obsession with Sansa, like, is that even a true motivation for him? So my point was, is that he's telling Sansa the parts of his story that he wants her to believe in order to either give her comfort or to give her, you know, the, the strength to carry out the portion of the plan that he needs her to carry out. Um, but can we even like, you know, do we have to now remove the possibility that he has, this obsession with Sansa is one of his character motivations. Like, is he just truly chaotic? Does he have no other, you know, allegiances or cares in the whole universe? Yeah. Uh, I always refer back to the episode where he threw Lysa out the moon door. Mm -hmm. And he, he told Lysa, I think the only one truth we've ever heard Littlefinger maybe tell. And that is that the only woman that he ever truly loved was Catelyn. Mm -hmm. And uh, so therefore Sansa, okay, she's a substitute, but she's also a means to an end. Sure. Yeah. I don't, I don't think he has, I think you're right. He does not have that obsession um, so much. Although I also think that he had no idea that Ramsey was going to be the monster that Ramsey ended up being. Right. I, th I think that when he was talking to Roose Bolton, um, and, and saying, you know, I know very little about, or he's talking to Ramsey and saying, I've know very little about you. You know, I've heard very little about you. Yeah. And that makes him an oddity in seven kingdoms. Yeah. <laughs> That's what right. I was thinking. Like that kind of was an introduction to the possibility that maybe Littlefinger doesn't know as much as we've believed him to know, which kind of gave him some wiggle room here to maybe have made a, another mistake. But right. I think you're right in that he he did leave her regardless of whether he thought that would happen or not and left her unprotected and left her with an unknown as right. he it himself admitted. So but there's also a whole lot of conversation about how, you know, everybody knows that Stannis's army has dwindled. And yet in this scene, he tells Sansa that Stannis's army is stronger than Bolton's. So it's kind of an outright lie. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, that was just kind of a, a weirdness that I haven't really had a, a satisfying conversation about yet. <laughs> yeah, I, and I don't know if there is any reason other than just to ensure that Sansa feels safe if she stays there. Um, because what Littlefinger needs is for her to be safe there where Cersei can't get to her. And since he doesn't know what Ramsay's doing or has the potential of doing. He figures she's probably safer there than she is, you know, obviously coming with him to King's Landing. Yeah. So uh, the whole idea is maybe just, all right, well, if nothing else, I'll look better to her after she's been with the Boltons for a while than I even <laughs> do now. 
you know. Yeah, and if he if he in the end did want the you know title of the warden of the north for some reason, if Roos had married Ramsay to someone else, then that might have like taken that away from him, or, or made it more complicated for him to get it. Like, so he does kind of use her as a placeholder, and it's just happenstance and lucky that she's somebody he does want to have power over at least you know right if not a relationship with who knows <laughs> right and 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 his whole his whole plan is to get cersei to sign him on as the warden of the north when he goes down there right obviously and he even uses sansa to dangle and before he leaves town remember he's the one that helps Lady Olena get back at Cersei. So he's got the decree from Tommen already done because Cersei says when they talk, she says something like, I'll tell the king, just do a decree tonight or whatever. Mm -hmm. So he's got the decree. So now he needs Cersei out of the way to ensure that he doesn't have to kill Sansa. And the way he gets her, tries to get her out of the way is by giving Olena the information that the, the High Sparrow will use to bring her down yeah so then i guess if he did if he was at this point like he he did have you know decree in hand then it wasn't necessarily for not that he did uh, he did more on top of that in order to also you know secure sansa so maybe there's some indication there that he does care about her i don't know <laughs> well, like I said, I, I honestly believe that she is a good stand-in. Sure, sure, sure. That Littlefinger yeah. believes that she is a good stand-in. But I don't believe that he ever cared for anyone except maybe Catelyn. And even maybe after that duel, um, he didn't even care about her in the same way. You know, right. like that's kind of his turning point as a character and in a lot of um, people's minds is that like he just learned to stop caring about external things and care about number one and always look out for himself and and work on putting that energy he put towards you know, garnering someone else's affection towards elevating himself so yeah maybe even when he pushes lies south the moon door and says i only ever loved one person it was cat then that might have even not even referring to catelyn who died at the Red Wedding. That might have been Kat who died, who he fought for in that duel. And then after that, nothing, you know? So at that point, like Sansa is just a figurehead that he needs to obtain. Like all people are commodities to him mm. to, to elevate himself. So yeah, that, oh God, that puts such a dark spin on his like <laughs> encouraging this <laughs> like sermon to her down there. Oh Yeah. Okay, uh, but here's the only evidence that I can think of that is current, well beyond when Littlefinger and Ned's brother allegedly had this duel, that would indicate that Littlefinger still cares about Catelyn. And that was in season two, when he brought the bones to Catelyn. He was making some kind of play for her then. And it doesn't feel like he was caring any less about her at that point. Ned was gone. This was his one opportunity. And he was basically begging Catelyn to, I don't know, run away with him or something. And that was, of course, taken away once Catelyn pulled the knife on him and told him to stay away from her. But then he offered the bones just as Tyrion had offered. Up until the point where she pulled the knife on him, I think his intention was to be with her. So that tends to make me think that you can't really think that he had distanced himself from Catelyn even because of the duel. It had to be he, he was really actually genuinely angry about the fact that the Red Wedding happened and that she was a victim of that. Anyway, uh, what's your next question? My other question about like um, uh, somebody's internal, you know, what you gleaned from the actor, from the scene, from the dialogue, whatever, is how much did you think like Stannis felt towards Shireen in his 
very, I don't know, I wouldn't say impassioned, <laughs> but like, you know, he was very sincere about, you know, you are my daughter, but you, you know, technically he was stating facts. So it's hard to say <laughs> that he really yeah. had any feeling there. But, you know, for Stannis, that might be the closest it gets. You know, did you see anything there as to, like, he really cared for her? If he really did care for her, is it possible that he could go through what he goes through at the end of this episode? Or at the end of this season? That's the thing. It's, sure. it's like, um, how much... And this isn't this isn't a progression that goes between here and all the way down, or, you know, just from here... To the point where he allows her to be, Shireen to be burned. That this dark path that he's been going down on started on a table in Dragonstone in season two, episode two. <laughs> you know, I know, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. For and, sure. And, yeah. And, and so once that is crossed, and even though he tells Celise and he says he's ashamed and, she can. She actually says, ah, "You know, I'm. I'm happy. I'm such a fanatic that I'm happy that you're doing the priestess. You know, uh, it's just further fuel for the fire for him that he can just see. Well, I have to get to this end. We've heard him even in season four saying, you know, I'm not going to be just a side note in someone else's history book. He's already obsessed. He has to win Winterfell. Um, that doesn't mean that these two feelings have to be mutually exclusive, though. He can mm -hmm. still really care about his daughter. It's just that he now happens to care about his mission more. Mm -hmm. Or in that moment, maybe. Like, you could look yeah. at it and say, up until this point, that wasn't an option for him. And then that was a moment of weakness. That was a moment where he cared more about his mission than uh, his family. Which is such a contrast to like maybe the real Stannis and you know the Stannis without the Melisandre, you know, advisor, right? You know, and he's you've got like the the Stannis who's been this, like, and you get a lot of like background on him, and you get a lot of people's in, interpretation of him that they developed before there was Stannis with Melisandre. That you have to assume is that that's the Stannis, and now you've got this other Stannis, the the, the Stannis with Melisandre that might be a different version of himself might be the power is now achievable you know and again we're just on the harping on this theme of like when a when power is obtained it's used poorly you know yeah and it off and how it often is um even by the most unsuspecting of people but there's just one word to sum up stannis and that is fewer um, everything, <laughs> everything for him. I love is, it. I love it so much. <laughs> is, is you know everything for him is either correct or incorrect. And I think at the time that he makes the decision about Serene, as terrible as it is, he can't see that as anything but correct. Oh, and that's if you if you go backwards from that scene, like okay, so. Sweet summer children who only ever see this scene for, you know, who haven't seen the rest of the show yet. This is such a heartwarming, beautiful father daughter scene. But watching it from 2018 eyes, you're like, oh God, this hurts my heart. You just hear the factual nature of what he's saying to her. He's not mm -hmm. saying anything emotional, but he says it with a tone of more emotion than we've heard him before. So it kind of had that, that lie in there where it let you think mm. that, which is the equivalent of a lie. I think yes. it's a, le it's a lesser, it's a lesser truth. <laughs> it's fewer. It's a fewer. <laughs> it has, it has fewer <laughs> truth to it. <laughs> fewer truths in it than we originally thought. Yes. There you go. Stannis would approve. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> oh, these have both been so depressing, Matt. <laughs> let's, uh, can can, let's can we? Yeah, can we go to onto a, like maybe a happier question? Sure. Did Jamie predict how he was going to die? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. What did Jamie predict? 
they're having this conversation on the boat, Jamie and Braun, about, you know, a good way to die would be in the arms of a woman he loves or something like that. Do mm -hmm. you think that that was predictive, ominous, fortuitive? No, not unless it's Brienne's arms. <gasps> you don't think it's Cersei? Well, of course he loves Cersei. But does he now? I mean, he's left her by season seven. True. It's true. Will he always love her, though? Is that his curse? That is his curse, I believe. <laughs> in fact, I could almost see Jamie in, in the, and not to get too, uh, not to get too crazy with trying to just pick something up out of the air because I don't want to be like everybody else in that way. But oh, but if it's be, because if be, as <laughs> dr driven by the proof of how much he loves Cersei. I could almost see Jamie sacrificing himself to save her if the army of the dead made it that far or to wherever she was. I mean, more than just one of them in a box. More than just one of them <laughs> in a box. Yeah, for sure. That would be, that would be so tragic though. There's no fulfillment in that. Like he just totally like blindly never learns anything. Always, sacrifices his needs for there's, hers there's no fulfillment in much of life that to me would be the <laughs> best way for him to die yeah tiger can't change his stripes oh jamie can't change his heart <laughs> do you think that was predictive or do you think that was like a red herring or somehow it was supposed to be foreboding i think that was just supposed to or say, to like show jamie's romantic side yeah. yeah, I think I think it was more about character than it was about uh, foreshadowing. All right, fair enough. <laughs> All right, I've asked like sixteen questions. Do you have any? I want to ask. I want to make sure you get yours in. I have no questions for this episode. I, everything, everything seems so <laughs> obvious to me. Actually, what it was, Kelly, was that I looked and I saw how many questions you asked, and I thought. Yeah, she's pretty much covered them all. I'll just leave myself out of this. Let me do the lifting. You know I got them strong arms. I got you, Matt. <laughs> you do the lifting, baby. Go ahead. <laughs> well, all right. Well, since you asked, I got you. All right. Another one. Mostly, I just need you to answer these for me, and I'll accept everything you say as truth. So <laughs> <laughs> That's a mistake. You rarely make mistakes, Kelly. Let's, let's not do that. Well, I can also just blame you if you're wrong. Uh, <laughs> I just okay. have to ask the question. <laughs> that's, that's that's acceptable. I will take the blame. So would you say that Hisdar was acting for or being used as a distraction for Danny during the um, Sons of the Harpy attacks? Uh, that without would... his knowledge being used, I could see. Yeah. But, and... This, again, is one of those things where I don't really want to compare show and books and whatever. You can make whatever decisions you want to make um, if you're bringing book knowledge into the television show. But I'm not going to I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to go by what I see on screen and knowing what happens at the end of this season to his dar. Mm. Uh, if he was a willing participant in any kind of thing, I don't think he would have ended up dead. That's a good point. <laughs> Unless they saw him as getting too close to the queen somehow, or he was a useful tool and he was willing to, you know, play ball or whatever. But then, yeah, they saw him as a liability. It's a stretch. Okay. That's that's impl imp imparting a lot of uh, interpretation to to characters we never see their faces of. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's hard to, you know, if if we could look behind the mask and see somebody mouthing traitor. Or something like that, then you yeah. might uh, infer something different. But yes, I might have been imparting a little bit of, of book reader uh, uh, suspicion theory in there. I wasn't super sure um, if I could dissect the two in my brain, so I needed your help there. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> All right. So show wise, you don't think he was? Um, I think show wise, I he wasn't a willing participant. Um, now he may have been used by some. Let's look at who the sons of the harpy actually are funded by they're funded by everybody from volantis and from uh what was the city right before marine that she pentos uh, not pentos um the other city on oh, as, Bay. as as 
there was Astapor, and then there was Yunkai. Yunkai that's yeah. that's where that that other guy was from. Was from Yunkai, correct? Um, that we see in in the Battle of the Bastards that comes to do terms and ends up getting killed. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He was at least a leader. Right. So he was part of the whole Sons of the Harpy movement, obviously. So when you got guys from out of town that way, uh. Were they taking advantage of his star's audience with Danny? Uh, likely. How would they have that information? Well, his star has been going around talking to the other people. And maybe all of the people who are in with the Sons of the Harpy are saying, yeah, yeah, go back to the Queen and ask again. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, or it's like I, I just don't just, think that he was yeah. a, a knowing participant. No, and it certainly isn't portrayed that way. Like, you just see this emphatic, like, he's just so sincere when he talks to Danny. And we see him, obviously, continue that, that character trait. And that's why she goes to him and and why his character maintains throughout the rest of the, the, the series to till he dies. But, yeah, I think there's, it's just a suspiciously timed moment, I think. Yes. And, <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure that the... the showrunners may have been doing some kind of book nod to have that very thing going on <laughs> while while this attack happened possible and then that brings me to the 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 prostitute and this is just like a cool contrast between like you have this like brothel being raided right and these these prostitutes all being punished and then now in 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 king's landing and now in in marine they're like complicit. They're a part of it. I'm like, and you've got this one prostitute for some reason who just hates the unsullied to the point that she just keeps setting them up to get murdered. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it, the, the contrast was very apparent in this episode. And then just this one prostitute repeating her role of like assisting the harp, the sons of the harpy. I was just, was just curious as to like, is she just like a repeated character? Cause we've seen her face and we should be like, you know, oh, I should have seen that coming with that lady or whatever. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Well, the first time we ever really saw her was when that first Unsullied went into her place and mm -hmm. got cut, right? Yeah. So uh, it, it makes it easy to just hire the same actress again. But, but do we think I, so but beyond a, beyond a, beyond yeah. a, uh, <laughs> a, you know, just a practical thing. Um. What What is she again? She's a prostitute. Yeah. Who, who knows how much money the masters have given her to sure. do those kinds of things. Or, you know, honestly, this whole debate that Danny's having about the fighting pits, like they could have just said, like, she'll come after the brothels next and that's your livelihood. And that could have been motivational enough for her. It, it, that's true, too. Yeah. Plus, if we find out later on when Varys brings her in, she has a daughter. Mm. Um. So she's been trying to get money together. As Varys puts it, he's like, I can give you the money to get out of here. Get you and your daughter out of here if you tell me what I need to know. Yeah, so that, that is a point of vulnerability or a point of pressure. that might uh, and It been. might be a point of pressure, yeah, that maybe even um, she feels threatened by the Unsullied about. Um, after all, they were children who were just taken away mm -hmm. at one point. Or who knows, maybe she was a, you know, commonly patroned by the masters. And so she has a relationship with them and then they are like financing her child or at least maybe his, you know, her child is a child of one of the masters or something. And there's just a connection there. Interesting. Yeah. yeah oh. all, I, all I can do as to the why would be to speculate. So I really can't. Yeah. Oh, I like your speculation. I like it. And that was a good point because that's, you know, your your non-speculative memory <laughs> was helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. I've exhausted my questions, Matt. You've answered them all. Clearly, you were right every time. And uh, and if you're proven wrong, then um, I'll just I'll just remind you. <laughs> you know, just just uh, rub it in my face the next time you talk to me. <laughs> that's all that has to be done. I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm self-deprecating enough usually, but... <laughs> Self-deprecating enough, but no, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll take some more, some more punishment. Well, yeah, I don't want you to work so hard. I'll give you your own ammo. <laughs> oh, excellent. Thank you <laughs> I'm so there much. for you, Matt. I'm a good friend. <laughs> I, I, you've always have been. Thank you so much, Kelly. <laughs> Let's move on to tidbits. Yeah. Tidbits. And uh, again, 
my list has been uh, stolen <laughs> by someone else. Um, so I, I'm left with just one little thing that actually uh, was actually brought up by Kelly stolen in another section of the podcast. So I'll just quickly mention it. I, I just had the, the exchange of looks between Celise and Melisandre, um, when, uh, speaking of, when Melisandre speaking of Shireen's bloodline. It was very interesting to see Celise's reaction to, and this is kind of a caveat to what you were saying. Um, and th- the fact that, Celise kind of looks at her and then shies away and looks down and quickly goes away. And so that makes me really deduce that Celise knows exactly what's going to happen to Shireen, that she did see something in the flames when Melisandre showed it to her in that bath scene that now everybody complains, well, she didn't have the necklace on. (laughs) You know, I don't care about that. What I care about is did Celise actually see something in the flames or not? And to me, this is possible evidence that she did no i i didn't even catch that look so when i saw you wrote that i looked it up and i was like hmm, there is something there and of course me i'm all caught up on the the dialogue and and the implications and whatever and matt catches these subtle looks and reads into it from like future knowledge and i'm just like type 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 i'm so smart the obvious thing <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure I say that. <laughs> you make sure that you say it because that's what the tidbits are for. Go ahead. No, that was the obvious thing I said in my my big thing. But <laughs> oh, wow. well, you, see, you made it a big thing. It became obvious and a big thing. That's great. <laughs> I see, but you were downplaying. I did think that that was slightly different than what I caught, and that was interesting because. The Celise character is, is is problematic for me because she's just so so sad to see on screen because you're right like she's just totally like oh that's cool no totally bang the red priestess that's cool and like i'm sorry all i ever do is give you awful children and i'm like woman you like (laughs) you like carried these babies and and, you know they're this baby and in the show it's like babies that we see these like in the tubes yeah yeah. (laughs) like and she obviously like mourns over them or something. It's just so like she's just this like very tragic, no joy in her life character that I just kind of it, it's painful to see her on the screen. So when she had this look with Melisandre, I'm just like she's just like being totally like submissive to Melisandre. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, I didn't read into it from future viewing of like she or past viewing even because you could even say like she did see that flame vision with Melisandre. Right. He could be could have been could have been caught and that was a good catch. My my only <laughs> my only catch is, like tidbits are are a little silly, but like <laughs> So we talked in the previous episode about like the grayscale and how come it keeps coming up and all this. So I had to double check and it's not mentioned in the book at all how Shireen got grayscale. So of course, every time it's mentioned now, I'm just like, it's totally just foreshadowing or trying to keep it in the the viewer's mind. It's just a writer tactic, I think. <laughs> yeah. So that whole scene was just stood out for me that way. of Like Shireen, grayscale, like why does this keep coming up? It's just like digging into the wound of this poor child. <laughs> Brilliant foreshadowing by the writers to tell us that Dora <laughs> was going to get grayscale. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. We would never even noticed it. Uh, yeah. Well, no. Yeah. It was a little like over. I keep saying overt. Overt is the word of the day. Overt. There were some very overt um, clues that were, were being thudded on our heads here and that's one of them but i did i did think we had a conversation earlier about how shireen got grayscale and all that so i wanted to make sure i mentioned it here <laughs> right on. i did my research and and nope it's just a just a show thing <laughs> just a show thing and i uh i actually appreciated it um that that was a fun um way to have that happen mm-hmm. no no it was it was a good I mean, it's sad, obviously, for Shireen, but it was a, a it was, it was a, a fun little piece of thing that book readers can go, oh, I could see that happening. 
Yeah. And, and to me, that was what maybe even played into that, like imparting some emotion onto Stannis and to reading mm-hmm. into him a little bit, because I, I don't know, like it, it's not necessarily like a father's duty to like bring his daughter a toy when she's in a, in the crib, she's not going to know what to do with it. Like she's not going to remember you did that, you know? Right. So it kind of, it, it played into a little bit of my believing him to be a, having a loving core as opposed to his, uh, his iron core. (laughs) Setting you up for the big bat at the end of the season. Yep. Set the pins up and knock them down. (laughs) My poor pins. (laughs) 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 All right. What what else you got? The, the little tidbit, I just, I, I want to spread this to as many areas will hear this, is that that snake would not have harmed Jamie because it was red on black. So mm. if that means anything to anybody, there's a difference between coral snakes and king snakes. So the coral snake is deadly. That's red on, ye- or red on yellow. And that is a deadly fellow. Red on black. Venom. It lacks. <laughs> oh, right on. I know. I, the- I- I like what's written in the notes here. Red on black. Okay for Jack. <laughs> Red on yellow kills a fellow. The problem with that is that my brain will always invert those and I'll never know which is right. I'll say like red on black kills Jack. Red on yellow, that's an okay fellow. <laughs> oh, okay. And then I'll okay. go and try to pick up this coral snake and then I'll die, Matt. <laughs> no, we do not want that to happen. You have to be around for season eight because... We do have plans to have all of the sirens of the Song of Ice and Fire <laughs> on for our season eight cast. At least of at this course. point, they, if they if they don't kill me between now and then, of course. No, no, and don't just remember, Matt. If you see a snake in your house, it's red on yellow. Mm-hmm. That's an okay fellow. <laughs> wow. Yes. <laughs> Well, see, here's the thing. In a month, I won't remember we even had this conversation. So oh, fair enough. You're just, uh, <laughs> if, if you're really annoyed with me, yeah, switch it up. I won't know the difference. Do you honestly think that they would put, I mean, no. uh, uh, and, and hey, we're in Westeros. We're not in our world of Earth. Oh. Maybe red on black does kill Jack in Westeros. <laughs> It's a Westerosi snake, and yeah, it, it could have been deadly. And on, in all honesty, this was only for me. I just looked it up, and I just this is a very <laughs> mnemonic thing that makes my brain go twisty crazy, and I have to look it up every time. So, you know, there you go. Everyone else, enjoy never remembering which one's the deadly one and which one's the, <laughs> the friendly it's, one. <laughs> it's forever on tape now, and if we haven't confused you about it, remember, red on yellow, you're an okay fellow. Oh, black wait, no, black. no, uh, <laughs> red on black is okay for Jack. Red on yellow kills a fellow. That's the actual one. And um, if, you know, you're like me, you just say, well, then what about re- yellow on black? And then, of course, I just think Baratheon. And then I think of the parody song for, I don't know who does the original, but it's the black and yellow, black and yellow, black and yellow. And it's like a rap song about the Baratheons. And it's amazing. And look it up. I love you guys. This is, that's for you. That's a, that's a spreadsheet <laughs> fact right there. She's got that in one of her many spreadsheets, uh, you know, black on yellow. It, like one column, one space has black, and then the next space has on, and the next space has a yellow coloring, and then it goes black again. That's right. And then well, you want to sort it. You have to, if you can't sort it unless you separate them. So, yes, so you, you do, you know, column to text, you separate it. You know what I'm talking about there, my Excel fans. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but no for real there's a parody song that's about the baratheons and it's, it's about black on you know black and yellow black and yellow black and it's a rap song as well matt i need to explain rap to you so rap i'm just kidding <laughs> gotcha i love rap i want to hear you rap i can't rap i just love it all right you know, uh, all right well okay you got one more tidbit here all right, last, uh, last tidbit uh, was just my little soapbox, and I just wanted to make sure that everyone's really aware of the real-world parallels of, like, ideology forcing people to act outside of what they normally would have had their morals being defined by talking about the High Sparrow, talking about the 
I don't know, pretty much everyone in this show, but yeah, like the high sparrow is just like the saddest character to me about that. Cause it's just, he had such promise. He had such goodness. And then he just so quickly converted to Cersei's manipulations and just, you know, a cautionary tale. Watch out for how your ideology could be used to cause you to act outside of your, your morals and values. It happens to me all the time when I invite Kelly onto the podcast. I know. I keep trying to tell you. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't go well. Everybody's sleeping by the end. Absolutely I've not. They're riveted by every word. I've interrupted you a thousand times. Luckily I had mute on for half of those, but still. <laughs> oh, excellent. I'm so glad that you did that. Uh, <laughs> we'll have words about that later. In the meantime, three words. Little words. Three words. Describing the episode in three words. Uh, three words is where you try to describe the episode in three words. You don't necessarily have to come up with the whole thing. You can, I mean, your description of the whole episode. You can just take your favorite part or what have you, or maybe even something from your favorite character or, or maybe something like that. But Kelly has three words for us. Oh, yes. I thought it was a lovely parting story that Barristan went out telling Daenerys before he then went for a walk and she told him to sing a song for her. It was just a beautiful moment and he just got the, a chance to tell her about her brother and that he loved singing. And in my head canon, while Barristan was out there taking a walk for Danny, he was singing a song for her in his head. <laughs> Aww. Mm-hmm. Well, that makes my three words just like horrendously bad. <laughs> Barristan's last stand are my three words. Maybe I should change that. Uh, maybe <laughs> maybe we should look at, since overt is the word of the day, very overt episode. How about that? <laughs> Topical. I dig it. I vote for it. <laughs> if you get two, then I get two. My other one's Barristan the Bold. Rip. That was mine. All right. Barristan the Bold. Excellent. Folks, if you have three words... To describe this particular episode, you have time to submit them for feedback. The feedback deadline is January 19th of 2019. The, yeah, January 19th of 2019. If you get them in by then, they'll be included in our next feedback podcast. We do those at the end of every season, in between the seasons. And folks, it won't be too long. In April, Game of Thrones will be back. And I'll be asking you to submit your three words on a weekly basis to be read live on the air at the time. Well, the next day or so, but not, you know, <laughs> we're going to be doing this stuff. Uh, in fact, I'm just going to put a list up there of the people who submit them and I'm going to make Kelly read them all. Oh, yeah. And I will not get a single Twitter handle or screen name wrong. Nope. <laughs> I first started three words, Kelly, back when I was doing a podcast about Lost. And it was me and a girl by the name of Leslie Sonazero. She's Leslie. Really... Yeah, I listened to it. I loved it. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, Leslie's awesome. Um, she's a great piano player, great singer. But we used to just dread certain Twitter handles. Twitter was still <laughs> relatively new. It was only like three years old at the time back then. Um, three or four years old. Um, and I was a first year user when we started the podcast, so I had no <laughs> idea how to use it. And we would have such trouble with the, with the Twitter handles. We'd have to say them. And, and half the time, my, most of my edits were, were Leslie or I saying, how do you say that one? <laughs> how would you, how would you pronounce yeah, it? Is this one uh, word or two? <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, okay. Are ye with me? Okay. Oh, I couldn't, I, you know. <laughs> okay. I get it now. Oh, 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 that's funny. All right. Oh, good one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was totally what they were going for with that, that name, by the way, too, is like a moment of confusion and struggle and then a light bulb. Oh. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You just fed into it. <laughs> I was, uh, I was really bad at it. Something else I'm really bad at generally is picking brothel mates of the episode. That's next. <laughs> brothel mates, the best coupling of the episode. Doesn't have to be two people, folks. By the way, listen to that music underneath. 
Mm. You, you hear that music under there? Mm. See, what you need to do is go to the show notes and find out who's performing that music. Just read their name. You don't have to go to their website. I have their website listed. You don't have to go to their website. Um, a good friend of mine sets up that guy's guitars. That's how I know him. That's how I get to use this music. Anyway, uh, this guy, just remember his name and say, oh, yeah, that guy. That helps. Plus, you, you guys know, you listen to this podcast all the time. You've heard this song all the time. Wouldn't it be a fun little fact to be able to pull out the name of the person you are just humming along to in your head once in a while after you finish up an episode of Matt's blog? Come on. Ah, look at that. She's throwing <laughs> it in there. Uh, I will go first, I guess, <laughs> suppose, because... Uh, we did mention it briefly, but I didn't get a chance to talk about anything uh, in regards to the scene itself that much anyway. Uh, my brothel mace's time around are two people. doesn't have to be. It can be a person and an object, a person and a concept. You, you get the idea. Anyway, my two people this time around, and it is two people, Gilly and Shireen. I, you know, their grayscale exchange was not an obvious allusion to what was going to happen to Jorah at all. Right? I mean, we didn't <laughs> care about that. The second that the second that a guy, you know, dropped off of a cliff just after a beautiful scene of, of Tyrion just gaping at Drogon as he flies over, as he is, of course, fleeing <laughs> away from Daenerys as fast as possible. <clears throat> Sorry, I uh, must have caught your uh, laryngitis your through through the through the podcast. As I was device. saying, Drogon was fleeing <clears throat> from Daenerys just as fast as possible. But Tyrion got to see Drogon <clears throat> that way. And, and, <clears throat> and, and then this this thing that looks like a walking rock drops into the water. I mean, it's not the, the whole Gilly and Shireen thing wasn't meant to make us know what that is at all. <laughs> Nor was the experience in Volantis when uh, the red priestess that was there was talking about the stone men and Tyrion <laughs> noted. For no reason. <laughs> yeah. No, but Matt, that was really cute. And you have to understand, like, you have to assume Gilly has no social experience. Like, she's just, like, very much going to ask about somebody's disfigurement is, if she sees it. And to be fair, like, that's kind of refreshing for some people that have this and that nobody mentions it or everybody's used to it or people who know what it is but haven't met her before like look at it and don't talk about it because of like their social graces like it, you know i think the writers did a good job of weaving that in with gilly's character because sam knows what it is but he's not going to mention it but mm. gilly's got no social grace and she just asks right and shireen was very kind about it yeah she's a sweetheart they both are it's a yeah. good problem Matt, it's a good problem. Me. <laughs> All right, Kelly, how about you? Hmm. Well, speaking of Sir Friend Zone, I adored the combination of Tyrion and Jorah. Just Jorah's got that simple northern stoicism, just everything is as it is, and I'm not going to talk about it, and it's just going to go how I plan it until it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just paired by choice for some reason with Tyrion and he's just got this like intelligent irreverence that I adore and the combination is glorious it's basically like John and Tyrion again I just I, I loved it so much and it's just promising to be more and as we've seen this unfold we know it does become more it's great <laughs> yes beginning uh, to see Jorah's like first taste of it as he like ungags Tyrion so good right. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, once again, Kelly, thank you so much for joining me for this string of episodes. Three in a row. We two, did. Three and four. We did it. You didn't kill me. <laughs> I'm very proud of you. I'm very I'm proud of me you. for not inspiring you to kill me. <laughs> or maybe I have, and I just haven't found the red and yellow <laughs> snake yet. <laughs> Maybe it's somewhere here in the house. Um, I mean, you know, don't don't look too closely at your popsicles, Matt. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then with that, why don't you tell people where they can talk to you about A Song of Ice and Fire or the television show Game of Thrones? 
uh, tweet me, Twitter me, do the Twitter as Twitter's Twitterize me, Twitter at me. Uh, I'm at Kelly Underfoot on Twitter, and I tweet things sometimes, mostly just with Matt. But you know, I like tweeting things, and like all of Matt's friends are on there, so I'm on there, and we're all on there, and you know, we love. Yeah, it's all love, guys. <laughs> it's all Game of Thrones love. <laughs> It's all Game of Thrones love. So it is. And folks, we'll be back with another episode. We'll be joined next time by Stephanie and Bubba. My girl. Stephanie. I love Stephanie. You guys. You guys. You guys. You're very lucky that you get to hear Stephanie again. I love Stephanie too. She's awesome. That was right. That was right. (laughs) We we paired her up with Bubba for this next episode. So who knows how that's going to go. Um... But uh, they'll be, we'll be looking at Kill the Boy. That's next time. Take care. Bye. You've been listening to Matt's audio blog. Find all contact information, back episodes, and podcast app links at mattsaudioblog.com.